This is a common fate for these old 1990s mountain bikes, especially the cheaper steel frames. It's a real shame, this one seems to be in nice shape. I think these old 90s mountain bikes are worth saving. In today's video, we're going to keep this one out of the scrap heap. We're going to convert it into a proper gravel bike. If you ask 10 people what a gravel bike is, you get five different answers. If you do an image search, you'll see a bike with drop bars, 700C wheels, large tires, low gearing, disc brakes, and through axles. That is the bike I want to build. This frame is a surprisingly good frame for a gravel bike conversion. It's got really good geometry. Unlike a lot of bikes in the 90s, this one's got a really tall head tube. It measures 130 millimeters. This is a 17 inch frame, so it measures 17 inches center to center. It's got a 545 millimeter top tube. So this bike is gonna fit like a modern 54 gravel bike. So let's get this frame stripped down. I wanna remove the stuff I don't need, and then we'll take it over. I wanna start with the dropouts. Because this frame used a direct mount front derailleur, to give enough space for a 73 millimeter bottom bracket, the frame actually has a 68 millimeter shell. It's really good news for us. We can use a road or a gravel crank set in this frame without any modification. This frame has a 34 millimeter ID head tube. It's set up for one and one eighth inch straight steer fork. This is also really good news. A lot of the steel frames in the 90s, especially the early 90s, used a one inch headset. It's really difficult to find a modern disc brake fork with a one inch steerer. These old mountain bikes use a 135 millimeter rear dropout spacing. Modern through axle wheels like the ones I wanna use are 142. So we have to stretch the frame so those axles will fit. It's commonly referred to as cold setting you only want to do it on steel frames. There's a number of ways to do it. I'm going to use hydraulics. That's 141. I think that'll work. This is the through axle I'm going to use. It's an M12 with a one and a half pitch thread. I found a nut that it will screw into. What I'm going to do is bore out the quick release so the axle will fit through, tighten the nut down, and then I'm going to weld the nut onto the frame. And what that'll do is when I insert the axle, the wheel in place, and tighten it down, this will pull it together and make it work. So here's what I made. I took that nut, put it in the mill, and I removed some material. I did one nut that way, and then I did a second nut, but this one I drilled out. So here's how this works. This is the one I drilled out. It fits into the fork. The through axle slides through, and then this other side, the one with the threads, 
is fitted the same way. And then when this is tightened down, we've got our through axle. All right, so I put the wheels on with those through axle adapters we made. Everything looks centered. I checked all the alignments, they look good. So this is what those adapters look like in place. You can see that tab I cut out. It fits nicely where the old quick release dropout would be. The fork I'm using, this came off of a Schwinn circuit. It's a department store bike. It's not very well made and it's pretty heavy, but I had it and I thought it would be a good fork to try and mod to see if I could fit through axles. Now that I've succeeded there, I've got a fork with through axles and with ISO disc mounts. To hold this in place while I weld it, I'm using some all thread and a spacer. So I've got this set up so that when I tighten this spacer down, it fully clamps these adapters into the dropouts. And then when I weld them, they won't move. So now I've got to clean the paint off. I've got to get this welded. Now that the through axles fit, I want to turn my attention to the disc brake mount. I'm going to use an ISO mount. That will let me fit either post mount or flat mount calipers using the appropriate adapter. To figure out where the mount goes, I use a mechanical caliper and crank the pads down so that it bites onto the rotor. That way it's locked in place and I can rotate the wheel to figure out where it needs to go. I will have to remove this rear rack mount. It's right in the way of where I need to weld on the tabs. I marked the location of where the ISO mount needs to sit. I found this 3 16 inch piece of steel that I think will work really well. I want it to come up and sort of follow that angle of the dropout. So I think I'll cut the edge here kind of like that. And then we've got the two holes for mounting the adapter. I want this end to look pretty much exactly like this, but follow the angle of the rotor. So we'll do something like that. And then when the caliper is mounted, the body sticks down. So I'm going to need to add some clearance for that caliper body. I want to do the same thing on the bottom side. These two are at different angles. And I think that if I also cut a relief here, that that will make it easier to weld in place. So I'm going to make something kind of looks like this. Let's go over to the mill and we'll get it made. So that's how that turned out. It is in exactly the right place for the ISO standard. 40 millimeters center to center and 78 millimeters center to center on the front. I added some spacers between the bracket and the mount to move the mount outward. I did that so it would line up with the center of the dropout. I've got the brake mount sitting here exactly where I want it. I am going to put a couple tack welds in it to hold it to the frame. I'm going to do it while everything's together to make sure it's properly aligned. I've added some cardboard to try and keep weld spatter off the wheel and the tire. There's a braze joint right here, and if I run a weld through that, it will vaporize that brass and will ruin the weld. It'll ruin the dropout. So to try and keep heat out of that, I've added this vice grip here just to act as a heat sink. So I'm going to put a couple welds, one tack weld here and one tack weld here, and that will just hold it together and then I'll fully weld it. All right, so that's the mount after welding. I haven't cleaned it up. It's still covered in spatter. What I wanted to point out here is you can see the discoloration where the heat affected the metal. That braze joint didn't get hot enough to discolor. So if it didn't get hot enough to discolor, it didn't get hot enough to be damaged. So check that out. <laughs> 
The wheel's bolted on with the through axle. And the caliper works great. The alignment is spot on. I didn't have any trouble centering the caliper. I'm happy with the way everything looks. So now that this is done, the next thing to do is clean up the frame, get it ready to paint. The paint on this frame is surprisingly high end. It uses a candy finish. It's a three part paint. So it's a yellow base coat followed by a translucent metallic red, then decals in clear. Because of that, it's gonna be incredibly difficult to match the paint. So instead of trying to do that, I am going to use a neutral paint to fill in all the scratches and touch up the damage. My hope is that by having the color be different, but having all the scratches be the same, that your brain will tune it out and you won't even notice. Instead of painting the dropouts in the new ISO mount orange, trying to match the finish, I decided to paint them black. The decals on this frame are black and gold, and I decided to carry that paint scheme through the rest of the frame. Bike parts are insanely expensive especially mid-range parts. I want to use an 11-speed drivetrain with hydraulic brakes. Buying those parts new for this project, they're too expensive. It would make it not worth it. So instead, I look for parts that are either ugly or that don't work. I'm using Shimano RS685 levers. These are 11-speed hydraulic. I got them really cheap because they didn't shift. Basically, when you hit the shift lever, nothing happened. These shifters were really easy to fix. The shift mechanisms inside, they were just full of dirt. To fix that, I put them in my ultrasonic. That cleaned everything out of the shift mechanism. I then brushed in some fresh silicone grease. They also had some cosmetic damage. The levers are carbon fiber. They were scratched up. So I sanded those down and I gave them a coat of clear. So I want to run an 11-speed drivetrain on this bike. I already showed you the shifters. They came with a nice pair of SLX calipers. I found a pair of GRX derailers, just like the shifters, these were full of grit. I just had to take them apart and clean them out. And then everything else, all the wear items, I am replacing with new parts. So new shift cables, new hydraulic brake hose, new bar tape, that sort of thing. I've gone through, I've reconditioned all the parts. Let's get this bike put together. The frame on this bike is made to accommodate a top pole front derailleur. The GRX front derailleur I want to use is bottom pole only. I need to come up with a way to turn that top pole into a bottom pole. I found this pulley on Amazon. It's a nylon pulley with a 625 bearing pressed in. I think this will work out really well for converting the pole. I'm going to attach it to the frame with a 5mm bolt. What this will do is when the cable pulls upward, it'll turn it into a downward pole for the derailleur. To install the pulley, I drilled a hole in the frame and I installed a 5mm rivnut. 
I drilled the hole slightly off center so that the cable would align properly with the derailleur and also so it would clear the clamp. I originally attached the brake hose to the frame using some of these cable guide adapters. I really wasn't happy with that. The hose didn't fit very well, it looked really sloppy, and it covered up the decals on the frame. So instead, I modified the cable guide stops so that they would hold the brake hose. I installed a pair of these rivet-on brake hose mounts. This gave me four mounting points for the hose. It aligned the hose with where the original cable went, and it kept it off the decal. So after three weeks and about $1,000 out of pocket, I've got what I think most would agree is a proper gravel bike. So let's take a look at what I built and then we'll see how it rides. This bike rides way better than it's got any right to. It's surprisingly quick and nimble, especially given that it weighs 27 pounds. The brakes are amazing. It will stop on a dime. The drivetrain, it's not quite right though. I find myself constantly shifting between the small and big chain rings just to keep cadence. There are some things I learned while doing this that I think you ought to know. The first has to do with clearance between the frame and components. I said earlier in this video that you could fit a road or gravel crank to this frame. While that is true, you can install one of those cranks in this frame. You might run into problems with clearance between the chainstay and the crank arm. I've only got about three millimeters of clearance between the crank arm and the chainstay. I don't know if that's going to be a problem. If I run into issues with contact between the two, I will have to modify the chainstay later. I didn't figure this out until I was putting the bike together. I was waiting on a bottom bracket, so I never installed the crank. If you're doing this, fit your crank and bottom bracket early in the process so you know if you're going to have clearance issues. I'm running 700C by 40 millimeter tires on this bike. I've got 8 millimeters of clearance between the tire and the C-stay bridge. If I wanted to run larger tires on this bike, I would either need to modify the bridge or cut it out entirely. I mentioned earlier that the geometry on this frame is really good for a gravel bike. I was able to run a standard road or gravel stem. This is a 100 millimeter stem with a seven degree drop. My stump jumper conversion had a longer top tube and a shorter head tube than this Gary Fisher. Because of that, I didn't have a choice but to run a shorter high rise stem. So if you're choosing a 90s frame for a gravel bike conversion, keep an eye on the top tube and head tube lengths. Those measurements are absolutely critical if you want it to look like a proper gravel bike. I made a couple mistakes on this build that you probably noticed. 
The most obvious, I wrap the handlebars backwards. I do this just about every third bike I put together. I should have noticed when the crossover was on the outside of the lever, but I didn't see it until the morning. The adhesive on this bar tape is so strong, I won't be able to redo it without destroying the tape. When I was installing the hydraulic hose mounts, the riveter popped Aww. off and it chipped the paint on the decal. I was pretty upset about that when it happened. I put a little clear coat on it, I'll never notice. The third mistake I made, I put the front gold stripes in the wrong spot. I wanted them to fall right in line with the profile of the rim. I marked it out, I laid it out, and then when I put the tape on, I put it on the wrong side of the line. Despite those mistakes, I'm really happy with how this bike turned out. There are a lot of these 90s gravel bike conversions on YouTube. I've even got another one myself, but I've never seen one where somebody adapted through axles to one of these old frames. If you've got the tools and the skills, it really wasn't that difficult to do. Riding this bike around town, I get a real sense of nostalgia. Despite all the modifications, it rides exactly like I remember how these bikes rode in the 90s. If you enjoyed watching today's video, would you consider liking it? And if you'd like to see more content like this in the future, also consider subscribing. So that's it for today's video. Thanks for watching. See you later.